Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome on behalf of Radboud Reflex to this lecture, China and the New Silk Road. Um, it's the biggest infrastructure uh, project in history, connecting uh, China connecting itself to the rest of the world. So highways, railways, pipelines and docks are built in order to connect China to new markets. Um, the country is dealing with a massive overproduction, so these markets are highly needed. Um, and there's a lot of critique in the way China is doing this. It's, um, it's developing its so-called new Silk Road, also known as the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and the country is blamed for making poor people independent uh, of them by huge loans, uh, but also by investing in countries like Serbia. Um, it's afraid, Europe is afraid that China is buying influence in the European Union. Um, <laughs> you could also see it differently, and that's also a part which we're going to talk about uh, today. Um, Today we're going to discuss what implications um, China's gigantic infrastructural project means. Um, are we thinking, uh, are we at the brink of a new world order, for instance? Um, is this a bad thing or is this a good thing? Um, and how should we even determine who has the right to a place at the world stage? Um, we're going to do this with uh, Wang Jue, uh, one of our lecturers today, and Arun Shaikh. Welcome. Um, let me introduce the speakers to you. Um, Wang Jue is a sinologist at the University of Leiden, and she specializes in uh, Chinese political economy, including the Belt and Road Initiative, the Silk Road, in which we are going to talk about today. Um, Harun Shaik is investigator at the Netherlands Scientific Council for Government Policy, and he's author of several books, um, among others, The Opkomst van het Oosten, um, in which he explores the new Eurasian world order. Um, Wang Jie will give a lecture of 20 minutes in which he's going to uh, talk about Chinese uh, outward and inward uh, politics and economic um, development. Um, and Arun Shaik gives a lecture of about uh, 30 minutes after Jay's lecture um, about the Silk Road and China's historical and contemporary role in the world. Um, after this, so then it will be around, I think, 8 30. We're going to have a discussion with Matthijs van der Zand, he's a philosopher at Radboud University. Um, and in this discussion we're going to uh, talk about the fear for China and if this is a right fear or if this maybe is a sign that Europe is already in decay. Um, a lot to talk about today and uh, there will also be questions from uh, room for questions for you. I think that will be around um, uh, nine o'clock, uh, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, this program will end at 9.15, so we will end 15 minutes later than normally. Um, that's all. I would like to give the floor to Wang Jue. Okay, just test. Um, thank you for having me here. It's my first time in Nijmegen. It's a beautiful city. And uh, um, so I will talk about uh, the implication of Belt and the Road Initiative, uh, the, or the New Silk Road mentioned by Dave, um, the implication of Belt and the Ro uh, Road Initiative for, for China's economic development as well as China's outward economic expansion. Since um, Belt and Road Initiative is now a very important part of uh, China's uh, regional and inter-regional development strategy, so so it would be most appropriately to um, locate this strategy, this Belt and Road Initiative strategy, in the wider China's economic foreign policy and external economic relationship. Okay, so. Um, so there will be three main parts of my talk. First of all, I will um, briefly introduce the evolution of China's external economic relationship. So how did the China develop from a uh, isolated uh, communist um, uh, power in the 50s, 60s into today's uh, uh, world's second biggest uh, economy that is deeply embedded in the global economic um, uh, uh, system and international community, and how um, uh, did China um, 
uh, come up with Belt and Road Initiative and what kind of uh, uh, role the Belt and Road Initiative play in China's uh, external economic relationship. So it will be followed by um, a brief introduction of the Belt and Road Initiative. I'll show you a few maps uh, basically to briefly introduce uh, um, what the Belt and Road Initiative is and what region in the world it covers, but I will leave the most of uh, uh, elaboration to uh, Harun because uh, uh, he will he will uh, uh, talk more on the Belt and Road Initiative itself. And uh, last but not least, I will uh, talk about the implication of the Belt and Road Initiative for China, uh, what kind of opportunities uh, it brings to China and what kind of challenges uh, it poses on China's uh, future development. Okay, so I will start from the evolution of China's external economic relationship. Um, in the 50s, um, from the 1950s to 1970s, China was mostly, a, was mostly isolated from the mainstream international political um, uh, community. Okay, um, and there was some trade between China and the Soviet Union and other Eastern European countries, but uh, that was mostly China importing the industrial goods and industrial equipment that China was not able to produce itself. Uh, China needed it to for its industrialization, so China was mostly importing um, industrial goods and industrial. Uh, uh, equipment from uh, uh, the Soviet Union. And the links between um, China and the, um, the links between China and the um, developing world was uh, very much driven by the ideological and the political preferences. For example, um, China was uh, providing aid to Africa and uh, very much uh, to the communist uh, African countries. Um, uh, well, there's, there's something wrong uh, about the uh, pictures. Um, uh, the, the, the first picture was supposed to uh, show up first, so that was the picture showing to you um, uh, a Soviet expert actually came to China. Uh, there's a typical thing of a so Soviet expert coming to China to teach how Chinese workers to produce, to have industrial production. And the second um, poster is, uh, again, a typical uh, communist propaganda poster. Um, it says, uh, vigorously support the anti-imperialist struggle of the people of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. It's basically, I, it shows to you the link between um, China and the developing world in Latin American countries, African countries, uh, during 50s, 60s, 70s, was very much... Uh, um, uh, uh, stimulated by this uh, communist link between China and these countries. And uh, one, uh, um, uh, one example is uh, uh, China helped Tanzania build uh, one of Tanzania's uh, um, two main railway uh, system that is still running today, the Tanzan uh, Railway. And uh, guess who helped Tanzania build the other one? Soviet Not Soviet Union. No, East Germany. So again, you can see this kind of uh, uh, communist link between these countries. Um, However, the link between China and the Soviet Union actually got cut off because uh, the, the Soviet Union was not happy with uh, China slowly picked up this very radical approach to economic development, especially during the uh, Great Leap Forward period in late uh, 1950s and the early 1960s. So from the 19, uh, early 1960s, uh, the Soviet Union actually cut off the link with China. So China became even more isolated in terms of technological development, in terms of uh, 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 industrial and agriculture production. Up until the 1970s, China stepped back into the international uh, community again. Because uh, from the 1970s, China slowly realized that it has uh, f um, lagged far behind its Asian neighbors in terms of economic progress. Uh, the, all the other Asian neighbors were actually developing very fast, but China was still um, a lag behind uh, in terms of economic uh, progress. So China slowly came back, uh, stepped back into the um, international community and, wa and wanted to uh, re-establish economic links with Asian countries and other countries. One very um, 
uh, outstanding event uh, in the history of China's uh, People's Republic of China's uh, diplomacy um, was uh, uh, when Richard Nixon visited uh, China in 1972. It was a picture of a uh, um, famous picture of him shaking the hand of Mao. Uh, uh, that was when. Uh, Beijing and Washington DC started to um, talk about uh, having a healthy diplomatic relationship again. Um, so China um, in 19, so Mao died in 1976, and two years after that, in 1978, uh, a group of uh, um, more liberal, economic-minded, uh, reformist leaders uh, um, uh, seized the power of, uh, of, of, of controlling the, the, the government, and they started a whole series of reforms, opening up and the reforms. So um, mostly um, uh, market-oriented economic reforms in China, as well as China opened up for international uh, investment. Okay, so I'm showing uh, you this map. Um, so you can see the four cities with uh, uh, the four cities with uh, uh, circles. The four cities in the south coast of China there: uh, Shenzhen, Zhuhai, Shantou, and Xiamen. They were the first four special economic zones. Okay, so these special economic zones had favorable conditions for uh, financial investment so the government also uh, uh, offered tax favor, uh, favorable tax conditions favorable labor conditions favorable foreign exchange conditions in order to attract investment uh, initially from uh, Hong Kong and uh, Taiwan and the reason the government uh, set up special economic zones in this area was because uh, um, many people moved from Guangdong province um, to Hong Kong and many people moved from uh, Fujian province to Taiwan. So they thought the business people in Taiwan and Hong Kong uh, would uh invest initially in China in this area. And then later on, um, it became a very successful uh, model um, because uh, the export uh, process industry uh, started to increase in these areas. And in 1984, so pretty much five, six years after the initial um, initial uh, special economic zones, 14 other uh, coastal cities in China said, uh, we also want to be special economic zones. We also want uh, foreign uh, investment, and we also want to develop export. We also want to be connected with, uh, with the world. So these 14 cities also became uh, um, special economic zones. And then later on, more and more cities all over China became uh, special economic zones. And nowadays, special economic zones are not special anymore. They're basically the, the, the zones uh, um, that uh, attract uh, uh, international uh, investment, which are all over China today. Um, so from the mid-1980s, China also uh, started a whole series of liberalization in the foreign uh, trade system, for example, give more freedom to the foreign exchange uh, regime, let the companies to um, uh, 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 exchange um, for, for foreign currency uh, uh, more freely because you, you need the US dollars to make uh, uh, business deals with the world. So the government made uh, this kind of transactions more easily and the government government also opened a, a, a number of other uh, restrictions in order to smoothen uh, external trade. Um, and from the 1992 onwards, uh, there, they, there were more and more um, FDI's foreign direct investment flew into China, and also China started another round of uh, um, a trade uh, liberalization um, uh, in order to prepare for um, the WTO membership, because in order to join the WTO, China needed to remove uh, uh, tariff and the non-tariff trade uh, barriers. China need to um, make the uh, investment more um, uh, welcoming for the foreign companies and also China need to set up a whole series of uh, regulations uh, in order to facilitate uh, this kind of external uh, links. Um, so China joined the um, WTO in 2001 and that was also when uh, China's uh, export started to go up really fast. Um, 
so from this World Bank, um, World Bank graph, you can see that um, this is about 2001, okay? 2001 here, and that's 2007. You can see after China joined the WTO, the export went up really fast. It declined later because of the global financial crisis that I'm gonna talk in a, in a minute. But you can see here the, the, the WTO membership really affected China's export. China started to export a, a lot to um, all over the world and China really became the world's manufacturing uh, factory. So China's uh, uh, export uh, uh, soared and also China's trade with developing world started to increase fast, uh, including with the Eurasian countries, with Africa, with South America, with uh, uh, the Middle East. And China also became the most important trade uh, partner in, um, Asian, in the Asian region, replacing Japan and the South Korea, becoming the, becoming the most important trade partner of uh, uh, all the Southeast Asian countries. Um, and in 1999, China started to promote this policy called China's going on out policy. Basically, the government was encouraging Chinese companies go abroad to invest. Um, initially, the Chinese companies mostly went to advanced economies, Europe and the US, but later on, they also went to uh, developing countries. So why did the government promote a policy like this? Because China started to earn more and more foreign reserves. And these, uh, this, the accumulation of this uh, big uh, foreign reserves uh, put forward a pressure on the uh, foreign exchange rate uh, of, of renminbi. Um, and uh, this kind of pressure pushed the Chinese companies uh, essentially to go out to invest. And, and also the government wanted these companies to go out to invest um, and learn international, uh, to, to learn more advanced uh, man man management skills and more advanced uh, technologies. Okay. Um, so this is a basic graph shows to you from 1995 to 2012, uh, roughly um, uh, um, 17 years, um, China became a, a much more uh, important trade partner than Japan for the other Southeast Asian countries. So the, in the most recent uh, um, period, um, between 2009 until now, uh, the, the going out strategy continued to expand, and China also started to promote the use of uh, uh, renminbi, Chinese currency, in the international trade and investment transactions. Um, China's investment in the developing world um, increased rapidly, the Chinese investment in the developing world initially was in mostly in natural resources, and then later on, uh, more moved towards uh, infrastructure and agriculture, and then now more and more flew into um, service and the manufacturing. And also, um, within this uh, big, um, uh, the expand of uh, Chinese investment in developing world, um, uh, here comes the Belt and the Road Initiative. Um, in in uh, uh, first time mentioned by President Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping in 2013, and now it it is a big part of China's uh, um, China's uh, um, uh, uh, foreign um, uh, uh, development strategy. Um, so I can show you that. Uh, uh, this is uh, basically the distribution of Chinese investment abroad. You can see Chinese investment uh, relatively equally uh, 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 spread uh, all over the world. Um, and uh, Chinese investment in the developing world, for example, uh, Africa, um, was initially um, mostly in the energy, but you can see the proportion in energy has uh, decreased and the proportion in other sectors, for example, um, uh, uh, real estate uh, or transport or, or, or technology, utilities, um, have started to uh, emerge. Um, China's investment in 
um, developed economies are mostly targeting strategic asset seeking uh, or uh, market seeking. For example, uh, Huawei, uh, we all know Huawei. Huawei set up its office in Europe uh, to develop uh, technologies, also to uh, uh, attract uh, talented uh, European graduates to work for them and also for targeting the European market. So this is a typical um, uh, example of market seeking and a strategic asset seeking uh, investment. And at the same time, China also um, uh, uh, put a lot of efforts in establish its own role uh, in the regional and the global um, governance, especially the governance of development, developmental finance. Um, and one famous example is the uh, establishment of Asian Infrastructure Investments, Investment Bank, which is the China's version of World Bank, China's version of um, Asia Development Bank. Um, but then, of course, uh, this big uh, outward expansion also faces uh, uh, challenges and risks. And these this risks are from uh, multiple uh, aspects. Uh, first of all, um, uh, 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 China... Um, well, China was not initially hit by the global financial crisis in 2008 because uh, uh, by 2008, uh, more advanced economies like US and the European economies were hit more um, severely by the global financial crisis and uh, China escaped it. But then later on, this, uh, this pain from the global financial crisis started to hit China, hit China slowly because uh, China very much uh, depended on uh, export to uh, European market and America market. If the European and American market declined, that means uh, uh, they could consume less Chinese goods. So actually, China's export uh, to, uh, to the world has decreased. Uh, remember, the uh, graph I showed to you from the beginning has decreased rather sharply. Um, and also, China also suffers a number of uh, financial and economic pro uh, problems domestically that I'm happy to elaborate later on. Um, so because of these risks, risks um, to make good investment decisions, good investment choices along the Belt and the Road became extremely um, important for China. Right, so um, very briefly, Belt and the Road Initiative. Uh, you can, if you Google it, you can see a, a lot of uh, graphs of Belt and the Road Initiative. This is the one I like because it's simple. Um, and for example, this is a very complicated one that looks almost like the blood vessel of your heart. Um, so, so in, in this, and, oh, and this is the one I made it by myself. I, I added these pictures, so basically shows to you um, uh, the the state, the, the, the involvement of state actors in this uh, um, Belt and the Road Initiative. So what is the Belt and Road Initiative? Belt and Road Initiative is China's uh, inter-regional development strategy aiming to uh, connect multiple countries in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Central Asia, Middle East, Africa, and Europe. Okay? Um, so... Um, However, the perceptions about the Belt and the Road Initiative vary. Um, some view the Belt and Road Initiative as China's geopolitical tool for challenging U.S. global dominance, but some uh, think it's China's devotion to the U.S.-led global capitalism. Um, some view uh, Belt, and the Road, Belt and Road Initiative represents China's aggressive outward economic expansion at the expense of others, but some others... Um, think it is a uh, altruistic uh, contribution to international cooperation and development. Um, this is also how China uh, brands it and uh, um, promotes it. Um, there are problems in the um, oversimplified way of viewing Belt and Road Initiative. Um, many analysts tend to overestimate the geopolitical motivations of the BRI, and some uh, speculate and exaggerate China's capacity in shaping international trade and investment regimes through the BRI. Is the BRI going to completely change the international economic order? Probably not, because a lot of the deals of the BRI didn't really um, start now. It started uh, many years before. China has slowly established its relationship with Eurasia. It's not something China started to do very suddenly. Um, and also, 
um, uh, many um, uh, political analysts uh, tend to focus mostly on the state actors, so, so they would um, uh, propose a lot of uh, uh, more state-centered, security-based or, or, or geopolitical-based um, uh, conspiracy behind uh, the BRI story, while uh, in reality these investments are mostly carried out by uh, companies. Um, or, or, or people, right? Because uh, it's also about a people-to-people -people, uh, exchange. So, um, I, I, very, I, I think I'm over time, but I'll be very quickly go through the uh, opportunities and the risks, uh, opportunities and the challenges uh, um, that is posed by the BRI for China. Um, of course, the BRI is supposed to bring a lot of uh, opportunities for China. That's why China's doing it, right? So um, one opportunity is it provides an alternative route for energy supply. For example, the Guada Xinjiang link. Um, this is a quite bad uh, picture, but uh, uh, this is Xinjiang. Uh, this is uh, uh, Pakistan. So, so Guada is a port in the south of uh, Pakistan. So China is trying to set to set up a to build a railway there. So if the railway is built here, you can see that the energy coming from the Middle East and the Middle East and the and Africa wouldn't need to go through the very complicated uh, and the far uh, 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 maritime route or going through this uh, very complicated uh, uh, Malacca Strait um, and the energy could be shipped to Guada and uh, shipped through railway to China directly. Okay, um, and also um, the BRI brings opportunities for um, investment in, infra uh, in infrastructure. So China likes in investing in infrastructure all over the world. Why? Because uh, that's something China actually is good at. So China has a China's not a, the world champion of providing financial service or legal consultants, but China is a pretty good in the, uh, building roads and the bridges and the ports, and uh, that's also why China. Um, Build the roads, ports, and the ro uh, railway, um, uh, uh, and bring Chinese experience uh, to the Eurasia area. And also, the BRI brings opportunities for developing Western cities um, uh, into trade and investment hubs. Um, B uh, Belt and Road Initiative also brings opportunities for investment in other sectors such as financial service, logistics, trade, energy, technology, etc. Especially in the in the in the future. Um, and of course, it, it, it is a massive business opportunity for China's own state-owned enterprises. Um, a lot of these projects actually go to China's state-owned uh, state enterprises directly, which has caused some concern because uh, other companies, foreign companies, complain it is unfair um, if an uh, international deal uh, uh, from one country to another fell into China's state-owned enterprise. Then um, in the long run, it's also not good good for the operation of business because uh, good competition, fair competition brings better uh, practice. So, um, but uh, um, I don't think China for now is ready for um, a more transparent tending, tendering system to bring in more international bidders. So for some time to come, we will probably uh, continue to see most of these deals will be for China's own state-owned enterprises. Um, and also the Belt and Road Initiative is an important platform for strengthening relationship with China's relationship with the development world. Uh, it strengthens China's regional influence in, in South Asia, uh, South Asia, Central Asia, and East Asia. It also bridges China um, with uh, more advanced economies um, in, in, in Europe. Um, because China is a uh, developing intensive uh, relationship, um, uh, cooperation with uh, Eastern European countries uh, nowadays, uh, and they call it uh, 16 plus one, so 16 Central and Eastern European countries uh, um, and China. China is the plus one. So um, this allows China to practice economic activities under EU regulation because some of these 16 countries are EU members. It allows China to uh, practice uh, economic activities under uh, EU regulation at a lower cost, okay? And also 
provides grounds for China to balance against the U.S. and uh, uh, to allow China to set up unique developmental finance rules and uh, <laughs> practice that are different from existing ones. But then, of course, it also involves a lot of risks. Uh, the return on investment is, uh, is challenged by a domestic political situation, domestic economic situation, and secu security issues. Uh, China invests in a lot of countries along the Belt and Road that Western countries uh, tend to not invest. And there's a reason why Western countries don't go to those countries to invest, because it's, it's more risky uh, in terms of polit politics, in terms of security, in terms of uh, economic reasons. So those are big challenges for Chinese. Um, and also, uh, Chinese investment also uh, are sometimes uh, suffer backlash, uh, pushed back um, uh, by the local societies. Uh, and also, they involve a lot of uh, environmental concerns. Uh, uh, that's something the Chinese investors need to deal with. But then, of course, um, from uh, inside China, a lot of these projects are funded by Chinese uh, state banks. Um, Chinese state banks won't uh, um, have endless money forever to fund these projects. Right? If these projects are not efficient, not uh, profitable, then the government at some point will consider not to provide as much um, money for these, uh, uh, these, uh, these projects. And the last but not least, uh, um, there's an economic slowdown going on in China. China itself faces lots of economic challenges, uh, which makes its uh, outward investment uh, further uh, extra um, risky. OK, so I'll stop there. Sorry about uh, the, the extra time. <laughs> but I'm, I'm happy. I, I didn't manage to e elaborate on some point, but I'm happy to answer to questions later. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you also for uh, having me here tonight. And thank you for an interesting presentation, Wang Yue. I think uh, it fits in nice with the story uh, I would like to uh, tell to you now. Because whereas you worked from the inside, China's internal development, and showed how the Belt and Road Initiative fits, it, fits into that, I would like to take a more of an international perspective, you know, look at what different sections of the Belt and Road, look at how they impact other countries, what is at stake in China's relations with different countries? And I'll try to go through all kinds of different domains of the Belt and Road and discuss what is going on with China's relations here with those countries. Um, so looking at more from, from that perspective in terms of what China's impact on the inter international uh, world will be. Um, but before I do that, I think it's important I would like to make a bit of a more general uh, presentation. Um, because I think we can quickly dive into what is going on with China in Pakistan or in Sri Lanka. But I think when we're talking about the potential impact that China is going to have in the world, we also need to face at how we look at China and what kind of view we have of it and what kind of preconceptions we have of it. And I think it's really important to, to, to face those kind of preconceptions because I think we still have a very simple view and false view of China. Very often the idea is China is a country that's uh, it's, it's very good at cheap production. <coughs> it's not innovative. Yeah? Everything that's organized, everything that's planned, okay. But, yeah, and still we often hear that in all kinds of uh, uh, economic discussions, creativity, truly innovation, that's something China isn't capable of. It's something either because of the communist system that's very top-down, or it's because of ideas about Chinese culture that it should be authoritarian and it doesn't give much space for individual freedom and creativity. I think that's the wrong view. Uh, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a great mistake, and I'll, I'll go into that in a, in, in a moment. Because I think what we also often hear uh, is that if we hear from innovation about China, we often then also have this kind of stereotypical view. Perhaps some of you heard today, right? There was this news that uh, Chinese scientists uh, had succeeded in uh, creating CRISPR children, right? Uh, this gene editing thing. It hasn't been confirmed, so we're not sure if it really happened. But that also really ties in with the stereotypical view we have of China. If they do something innovative, it's, it's, it's without morals, right? It's without all kinds of scruples that we have here about the human soul, and, and they just a bit machinal, right? Um, 
And I think if we keep having those kind of views, uh, that kind of view of, of how China works, I think we don't understand anything about what the country is about. And we're also really risk underestimating the impact it will have on the world. That is the one thing I would like to take with you. Don't underestimate the power of Chinese culture, what it's been historically, and what it can be in the world. Um, and let me briefly then start a bit by showing how that was historically. Uh, because these conceptions that we have about China, they're really quite recent. Uh, and they don't really show anything about uh, the role China traditionally has played in the world. Perhaps some of you are familiar with this graph. This is the distribution of economic weight in the world from the year one to about currently. And there you can see that basically for all, it's, it's not a, a, a direct scale, so it moves up to 1820 over there. And there you can see that basically throughout all of history, Together with India, China has been the world's biggest economy. You can even go a thousand years further back. Eh? If you go further back, it'll be actually a bit smaller, because then you see that the Middle Eastern section will be much more dynamic. But throughout most of our history, China has been huge. It's been the biggest economy. It's been basically what the world economy has been about. That's also where, of course, the whole reference to the Silk Road is about this. This was where everyone was going for their wealth for. Even in the 18th century, you had English kings who would write letters to the, to the, to the Chinese emperor, and they would ask them, well, we want to trade with China, and then the, the emperor would reply back, that's all real, ni real nice, but we don't think England has anything that we want, so we're not allowed to trade. Right? <laughs> this was the position China could take, because it was simply that wealthy, that dynamic, and that progressive in terms of uh, economic uh, technological development. Um, well, you might object, of course, that's, uh, if you have the biggest population, probably you're going to be the biggest economy in the world. But it's not just about quantity. It's not just that China was, has so many people and that's why it was economically so, <coughs> such an important center of the world. Uh, China has also been, throughout its history, terribly innovative and shown itself, especially its state, to be, to be very capable. We all know, of course, the Great Wall of China. But I want you to reflect a bit on, how, on that object and what it means. Consider what it's like. If you're a country, a pre-modern country, right? We don't have cement, we don't have bulldozers. You're a pre-modern country, and you have this more than 10,000 kilometer long border where sometimes you have these wild nomads coming into your country, and you even think about the idea that you're just going to build a wall along, the, along that whole range. Nobody has ever, no country has done that in history. No. Nope. <laughs> well, in history, right? And he still he can't. And still he can't manage, right? And he has bulldozers. He has these big companies. He has, a, he has cement. This was historically, no country has had such a big border and decided, let's do a tremendous engineering project. The biggest one, right? The biggest ever. <clears throat> right? We're not going to just fight them and see, wait and see like everyone else did on the Central Asian plane. No, China built a wall. Yeah, and it required tremendous engineering, it required planning, it re required a state that was very capable of doing these kind of things. And this is just one example. The other thing here is the Great Canal, um, perhaps also known. It, it connects the, uh, uh, China's two main rivers, the Yellow River, the Yangtze River. It was also built hundreds of years ago. It's still the biggest canal in the world. Longer, I guess it's long. It's, it's, it's a tremendous, uh, it goes right through China. It connects northern and central China with each other. <clears throat> These are just the more, uh, you could say, uh, <coughs> clear uh, projects that China developed. But if you look in terms of general innovation, uh, building compasses, paper, uh, <coughs> technologies for, for, for building, uh, China really has led the world in many ways. So how have they done that? Hmm? And let me just say a bit about what, what, what I think uh, explains how China has been able to do that. And that has to do with the organization of the Chinese state. China has historically been led by what, you could, what has been called the Confucian scholar bureaucrats. These were people who, uh, you could say very simply, I mean, these are people, they governed the state, and these were people who were capable, who were selected because they were the most capable, the smartest people to do this. This for us may seem very common, currently, but this was truly an innovation by China. <coughs> Throughout the rest of the world, also in Europe, 
in Europe, even in the 19th century, if your father was a nobleman, you could get into parliament. You had a role to you could get into the state. <clears throat> Nobility, birth, uh, wealth, all kinds of things that were really very important uh, all around the world for, for getting into the state, which meant that not the best people ruled. China could build the Great Wall, it could build the Great Canal, it could create a country as big as it is, and keep it intact for more or less 2,000 years, ever since it got unified uh, by, 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 the, by the Qin Emperor, because it was ruled by smart people. It selected the best people. And they also had a, a mechanism to do that. This, I'd say, is, as you could say, the, the, the secret of how China did it, which was the state exam. Uh, very early on, already in the early centuries uh, 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 AD, you're seeing this system develop in China, where they would say, if you want to be in government, you're going to have to do an exam. And not just a normal exam or an exam you can cheat on or everything. We're going to take this very seriously. So we're going to lock you up in a little cabin like that. It just has a number on it, so nobody knows who's inside. In many instances, what you've written down, somebody else will write again so that nobody can recognize your handwriting and nobody can help you. And you're going to be there, in some cases, for days. And they're gonna, we're going to ask you what you know about the, the Chinese classics, what you know about geography. We're going to give you big essay questions. And you're going to keep running, and we're going to select the best people from the vast people uh, selection China could choose from. We're just going to select the best, and only then are you going to be allowed to get into the state to work as a civil servant. This, this system started very early on. Over a period of, of, of 1,500 years, it got perfected, where it really became something where you could say, well, we're talking now about Harvard and Oxford and everything, but this is really a serious. This is a real system where you're talking about selecting talent. And this was perfected over a very long period of time, and it wasn't just once to get into the state. If you wanted to advance, you had to go through it again. So this was really a system that China developed early on, and I think this is the secret. If you want to explain why a country, a country can, in the second century BC, become as unified, just like China is currently, and keep it like that, more or less stable, for two millennia, you need to have some kind of strong capacity in your state. And I think that has to do with the bureaucrat scholars that were created by Chinese state system. So that is for my historical introduction, and at least it, I hope it sh shows a bit that we need to think differently. And if we're, talk, we're saying things like, oh, China, it's not innovative, it's not creative, it's not uh, <coughs> uh, capable of uh, <coughs> things that we do here in the West, I think this, is, this should be, serve as a reminder that we should consider this very differently. Now, now I'm going to go, uh, the second part, uh, work, go get a bit more concrete and look at if, if China is going to play a big part in the world, and I'm, I'm convinced it is, because of this, this, this venerable tradition, China has the capacity to truly impact the world uh, in a great way. Um, how, is that gonna, how could that play out? And in what way uh, is China affecting the world and the countries around it? Um, focus there on the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, as I think if you showed the same picture here. Right, and with the same intent, also I want to show, like, this, this looks very chaotic, right? I mean, yeah, the, the artery system, I think that's a nice analogy. We hear a lot of things about uh, uh, the Belt and Road. Um, everything is, is often groped together as part of the Belt and Road. We're talking about state projects, but whenever a Chinese company buys a media company in Portugal, everyone is also talking about the Belt and Road, so it's not at all clear. Is that officially part of it or isn't? If something happens in Nicaragua, it's also part of the Belt and Road. So you hear all kinds of different stories, um, and I think, in part, that's simply the way it is. I think the Belt and Road Initiative is not something that's written in stone. It is a concept that's evolving, over time, China already is, is making adaptations to it, making it more explicit, responding to all kinds of challenges, and then adapting the plan. I think because of that, because it's a plan in, in, in information, in process, in the end, it will have no, no, no limitations. I think in the end, we will, in year, a few years, we will say that every country in the world is listed within the list of countries that China sees as part of its Belt and Road. It's really about a trade infrastructure that China is developing. 
And in, in time, it will uh, span just about every domain and every country that China uh, will look at. But that doesn't mean that we cannot see some kind of order in it, or at least look at different parts of it. Because more specifically, if you look at all these different projects, there is a general type of organization to it. <coughs> it's called uh, the Belt and Road. Uh, uh, confusingly, the, the road is not the thing that goes over land, but that's the one that goes over sea. The belt is what goes over land. And it's usually the identified that you have. So you have the road, the maritime road. I'm going to come back to that later. And then over land, there are six corridors. Six parts uh, that are identified as elements of the BRI. So let's go into them a bit more specific. Two of these corridors connect on a, over a northern road, connect China to Europe to the heart of Europe, to the uh, Netherlands and, and Germany as well. There are two roads. One goes directly here from China through Mongolia, directly into Russia, and then all the way to Europe. And the other one here goes through Central Asia and then connects to Europe here. What is at stake here? I think core here is the strong link, and I think this is really one of the most important elements of the Belt and Road, the strong links China wants to create with Europe. And there are different reasons for that. Europe, of course, is still the biggest market in the world. So there's a tremendous export and import possibilities uh, for uh, China there. There are great economic synergies, especially with a country like Germany. I think there's a very strong focus on Germany in, in China. Uh, you could say uh, China is an industrializing country, and Germany is an advanced industrial country. So in many ways, uh, China can learn from or, uh, and needs all kinds of th skills that Germany already has. Uh, and uh, also to fuel its economy. Uh, as, as China develops more and more, it needs all kinds of complex machinery that Germany is very capable of making. So you're seeing for quite a long time, especially China and Germany, their economies are growing together. Mm. At the same time that China is grow expanding its role in world trade from about 2000, you're also seeing ger German exports to the East ballooning. So there's a very strong economic synergy. And of course, there is a more strategic political concern here. China, and I think that's that's the way we sh the primary dynamic that we're going to see the coming years or decades is a competition between the United States and China. Europe is the other big block, and China wants to create a strong relation as it can with Europe. I don't think it expects to to, to pry Europe away and to uh, 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 set it up against the United States, but at least have a very strong and deep relationship with Europe that on different fields they can cooperate together. That will be crucial if China wants to uh, become uh, a very important player in the global system. To get there, of course, uh, China needs to go through these roads, through Russia. Um, I think we often hear a lot about uh, China and Russia as being very strong allies. Um, I think in many ways they are currently, uh, especially Russian energy and, and, and the Chinese industry. They, they fit very well together, of course. And both countries um, are strong regional powers that would like to see a bit of a challenge to US supremacy. So in that sense, this brings them together. <clears throat> but in the long term, if we're talking about the relationship China-Russia, I don't think we should overestimate their ties. These countries are, in the end, also very strong rivals. Hmm? Uh, Wang Yue already well, mentioned the story, right? The reason uh, uh, Mao uh, eventually uh, went uh, uh, created, uh, created a deal with Nixon was because of tensions between the Soviet Union and China. In different phases of the, of, of the Cold War, the Soviet Union had more troops on the Chinese border than in Western Europe. These countries are rivals, they have all kinds of uh, geographical battles, but they're also just great powers, and they, uh, it, it's difficult <coughs> for them exactly to <coughs> get along. And in particular, that's also where one of these ro roads goes through. Central Asia is an issue here. That's not currently a big problem between the two, but you could say, well, Central Asia, Russia considers Central Asia what it calls its near abroad, which means it's our special domain. We're, we rule in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, these type of countries. Their energy sector is completely linked with Russia. Now, the Soviet Union created all the pipelines going through Russia and then to Europe so that these countries couldn't have independent energy policy. China is building its own pipelines to these countries. 
So already we're seeing that a few of these countries are now able to follow in, in to pursue independent energy policy, and this is a field I think in the future more and more Russia and China will compete over. So the next, the third route uh, goes underneath Russia, right? If, if you have a difficult relationship with someone, you should create options. Um, and this route uh, bypasses uh, Russia and a southward way. Um, this goes through a whole range of countries, and I think the most important thing to note here is how many Islamic countries this goes through. Uh, this is, I think, this, and this is also going to be one important part of China's international expansion. All around China's borders are Muslim countries. So if China expands, it will get deeply involved in many Muslim countries, which could go many different ways, but just the core fact is going to be well, what we have now with the West, the US in particular. If you get involved in those countries, you're going to be seen as either siding with or being against a certain party. You're going to have to have a more explicit view on what should be done in a, a country. That is now the concern of, country, of the US in particular. But my prediction would be China in the future will also going to have to have its own policy for this world, which is in many ways very volatile. And it will have to have an answer to that because many of its trade routes <coughs> go through these countries. There is already a very explicit policy in this field. Iran is a very strong partner uh, uh, of China in many ways. Um, a key uh, geographical part also of the Belt and Road. It, it has always been throughout history a link between West and East. Um, and the fact that Trump is again f looking for confrontation uh, with, uh, with Iran is something I think uh, that was applauded in uh, Beijing uh, because it makes uh, their alliance with Iran all the more stronger now that Iran needs alternative partners. Um, how will that relationship go? As I said, I mean, it can go many different ways. I mean, this will bring challenges. Uh, one challenge we also of increasingly hear about is China's relationship with its domestic Muslims, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. Uh, many more reports about uh, uh, harsh uh, policies towards them. So this, uh, there, there is, a, in a sense, uh, and especially uh, concern with radical Islam in Central Asia is something that China is focused on a lot. Um, that's not to say that China necessarily has to be antagonistic with the Muslim world. Uh, another thing, I think and that's an interesting part also from the historical analogy. Historically, the, the Silk Road was a connection between Chinese and Arab traders. Hmm? And it's really interesting. If you go, I, I was this summer, I was in the city of uh, Xi'an. Uh, that's a city, it has its own mosque. It has the Muslim quarter, where still you have Chinese Muslims uh, living there for centuries already. And that's, that's really an old historical link. And uh, it's, it's fascinating to see the type of Islam that has emerged in China as well. <laughs> but that, I think, is a history that needs to be re-engaged and is coming back in different ways. The fourth part just deals with just one country. And it was already mentioned, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, <coughs> Pakistan is uh, in particular, and uh, it's just of the six uh, belts, <coughs> Pakistan is one of them. It's, it's it got tremendous funds are, are, are allocated uh, just for Pakistan. So what is this about? Um, partly it has to do with the strategic relationship between these two countries strategic relationship in South Asia in particular. Uh, China and India are uh, competitors. In the future, there is only one country that has the size in Asia to become something of a challenger towards China's power. That is India. So mutual, uh, well, let's say sus suspicion of India really brings Pakistan and China together. Uh, has done so historically, um, and it's still a cause of tension between China and India. I'll come back to India in a moment. So strategy brings Pakistan and China together. There are economic uh, considerations for this link. Pakistan has a tremendous need for infrastructure. Uh, it has a growing population, an economy that's, that needs all kinds of uh, uh, infrastructure, but also capital, which China uh, is, uh, can provide. It has a, lo a large population for which, to which Chinese companies could outsource and uh, uh, create markets in. And the final part, but Wang Dui already mentioned this, is of course location. Uh, you mentioned the, the, the port city of Gwadar. Interesting, it was, it, started to, it was developed by a Singaporean company. And I always thought, well, this is interesting. I mean, this, this could be something more behind it. 
several years later, a Chinese company took it over, and the port, it was really a Pakistani fisher minister. There was, there was nothing here in the past. It's a vast port now. <coughs> They're building railroads, pipelines, and indeed everything so that energy from the Middle East can go directly towards the heart of China and bypass all kinds of sea routes that, are, uh, that have hotspots, but also uh, American, uh, strong American presence. Then next, uh, the, the road, the leg towards Southeast Asia. Um, I think this is also a special region. This is a region very close to China. It's a region uh, culturally quite, quite close to China, and where China historically always has had very strong links and, and connections. I mean, uh, for a thousand years, for instance, China ruled Vietnam up until the year 1000, and, and then, then uh, the Vietnamese uh, rebelled. Um, China's overseas Chinese are very present throughout Thailand, throughout Malaysia, Indonesia. <coughs> Singapore is more and more interestingly now, it's often being mentioned in China as Greater China. And so it's, it's not even seen as, it's even almost seen as a part of China itself. So this is a region where, where China has very strong links with. It's a region that's very close by, so it's of strategic great importance uh, uh, for China to have uh, influence and uh, good relationships with its, with its leadership. Um, and I've called it here China's Caribbean. Um, because thinking about it in terms of uh, uh, the ascent of a great power, um, I think an interesting analogy you could draw here is with the United States at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, what you saw then, the United States was the upcoming power, it was a booming economy, but still politically it had very little influence. So it had this sea right in front of it, the Caribbean, where all kinds of foreign powers had a strong presence. And that could always make sure that the United States wasn't able to go to the open seas because, for instance, specifically, Cuba was part of Spain. And Spain, uh, Spain owned it, and Spain, Spanish ships, but all kinds of British and French ships also <coughs> uh, roamed uh, the Caribbean Sea. So basically what the United States needed to do at that time was become uh, the regional power in its domestic sea. In time, it kicked out Spain from uh, Cuba. It took over all kinds of uh, projects in the region, and it started building new infrastructure that would connect it to the open seas. This is when the United States took over building uh, the Panama Canal. I think something similar uh, is, is going to happen in Southeast Asia and the re region uh, around the South China Sea. So here, for China, this is the same dynamic. This is our sea. This is the place where we go, to, where we trade with the world. So we need to be, well, uh, if, if not completely dominant, at least we need to have a, a, a stronger role in everything that happens in this sea. That's why they're building infrastructure there. That's why they're, 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 uh, uh, there is this contention about the South China Sea. And why China is also, uh, like the US before, considering all kinds of infrastructure projects. An interesting one that keeps coming up over time is here in the the, uh, the this smallest part of the Thai Peninsula, the, the Kra Ishmus, where there's an idea of building a canal. Uh, a vast, a great project, but also because uh, down there is, uh, it was mentioned already, this, the Strait of Malacca, this is where the US Army is, is. this is where, uh, uh, completely controlled by the West, and this would provide an alternative route around that. Next route um, is, a, is, is one route, huh? the, the Bangladesh-China-India-Myanmar economic corridor. I mentioned already, um, India is a difficult, uh, China's relationship with India is difficult. Um, I don't see any, uh, uh, we've had tensions of course in the last few years, uh, all the way in the Himalayas and the Doklam Plateau. Um, but these countries are naturally competitors simply because of their size and their, 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 the influence that they both can have in the region. This is also why India is the country in the region that objects most to the Belt and Road. Mm -hmm. it, it was not willing to sign any kind of uh, uh, declaration about the positive effects of the Belt and Road because India sees it as uh, encroachment by uh, Chinese influence on its own back door. Um, it's also because uh, China has growing influence in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, so countries uh, all around India. Um, in particular, about this route that I would like to mention, uh, oh, sorry, is the country of Myanmar. 
if the South China Sea is China's Caribbean, I would say Myanmar is China's California. And works in the same way, right? United States was, uh, when it started, it was a one ocean country. It started in the west coast, right? And over time, it, the, the, the frontier was conquered, was conquered. And because of California, the United States became a two ocean country. Hmm? Suddenly it had the Pacific Ocean as well as its border. And that gave it, gave it this, this tremendous possibility as a sea power to project power on the one hand to Asia and on the other hand to Europe. So China is already has its roots towards the Pacific, and Myanmar uh, would fit very well as a link towards the Indian Ocean. Over years, we've seen China's influence in Myanmar growing tremendously. For the last few years, we're seeing uh, Myanmar open, and I think this is the primary reason. Myanmar didn't open up because they thought, well, let's suddenly have an interest in human rights, or now let's suddenly have better relationships with the West. I think Myanmar's regime opened up because they felt that they were, becoming, they were becoming a colony of China and that they needed better relationships with other countries who were having uh, uh, sanctions against them uh, in order for it to gain independence. And I think the reason for that is because it is, if it's strongly linked with China, uh, it will give the country tremendous access also to the Indian Ocean. Which brings us to the maritime route. Um, so we've talked about the six overland uh, roads, parts of the, uh, the Silk Road. Um, there is then also the maritime link. Um, a few things important here. I've mentioned seas already. Um, this is with every country emerging in the modern era. Sea power is crucial because almost all global trade goes by sea. More than 90% of everything that we trade goes by sea. The reason why China focuses I think, so much on land is because the seas are dominated by the West and by the United States in particular. So I think one of the things that really also gives strength to the Belt and Road idea, and this idea of a Silk Road, is that it creates overland alternatives hmm, to not having go towards the sea where uh, someone else rules. But of course China cannot go uh, without uh, uh, also having a strong presence on the, the seas and oceans. Um, so that's where the Silk uh, Maritime Route comes in, a concept often by American strategists uh, about uh, how China is supposed, uh, how, how they think China is acting, is that it, they call that the China is building a string of pearls, and the idea is the pearls are different ports, and they are all spaces where Chinese commercial, but also in, in a future military uh, naval presence uh, could go. And these are hopping points from which China could by sea also <coughs> project power internationally. Um, that is how, how, how it's looked by externally. Um, I think what is already clear at least is that uh, this is a very important part of China's foreign policy. Um, we mentioned Gwadar port in Pakistan already. There's a port in Sri Lanka, Hanaban Tota. Uh, there also, uh, China is strongly involved. The, the country got into a, a debt crisis and uh, in return uh, created, I think, a 99-year lease for China. For the, so, so that's something that's a lot of concern for these countries. Are these ports and the infrastructure and the capital they're bringing, are these ways of gaining influence on us? At least in Sri Lanka and Pakistan, uh, and also one port in, in Myanmar, that concern uh, has become serious. <coughs> um, but anyway, throughout these, these, these pearls, uh, China is developing uh, uh, long trade links. Um, I think for us important also is, well, it says here, Athens, this should be Piraeus. Of course, this is, uh, I think, one of... Uh, uh, really also a fascinating and interesting approach that China has developed to um, seeking better relationships in Europe. It's always difficult, right, to say, well, we'll buy something. What happened here was, of course, Greece was the country hit hardest by the Euro crisis. And at, when the crisis hit, China stepped in and said, well, we'll invest in the Piraeus Harbor. Uh, this, this at least created an opening. It created also goodwill for China. And I think, and that's also what I think gives an insight into how, the, uh, how its approach works. It was also done with great care and with great uh, interest. So 
China didn't use this as something that they yeah, were going to take profits from themselves. They used it as a showcase to show how they could uh, benefit Greece from it. And they could do that very easily because all China had to do was send its own ships to Piraeus to make it a success, right? I mean, if you have that, those termine as amounts, you can create a harbor. Um, so this is one of the few successes of the Greek economy uh, over the last few years. Um, and it's, uh, I think, an interesting part of uh, China's strategy. Um, that kind of wraps up the, the different uh, elements of the Silk Road and a bit uh, my overview of <coughs> what kind of relationships it's building between China and different countries uh, that are uh, along the road. Uh, let me just uh, wrap up by uh, two other elements. Um, I mentioned the Silk Road is an evolving concept and all kinds of things are being included in it. Um, so there are at least two things that I'm also hearing increasingly often that you could see as future or other pillars uh, of the Silk Road. One of them is the digital Silk Road. Hmm? So this is the idea that it's uh, not geographically focused, but the idea that China is creating a technological infrastructure with other countries. Um, and you can see this along different lines. This would be the international expansion of Alibaba, hmm? creating logistics all around the Eurasian plain uh, with its uh, uh, with its e-commerce activity. Uh, this is uh, uh, the telecom infrastructure that Huawei is building all around Eurasia. Um, but also, uh, uh, China recently launched its uh, alternative to GPS, uh, the Baidu uh, system, its own version of, of, of uh, 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 satellite navigation. Um, and also, it's looking for to sign up other countries in this project. And the first overseas uh, station of, of this uh, uh, satellite system was in Tunisia. So also here, uh, China is, is, is creating uh, along the digital uh, route new connections, and one for the future, but one that is definitely people are preparing for, is the polar Silk Road. This is one of the size effects of global warming, hmm? is that the North Pole is melting, which means that the route, the, the trade route over the North Pole is getting, more easy, getting easier to sail it. Um, this uh, already, this is not just future, uh, already we've had a few ships taking this route, Economically, it's very feasible. Uh, going from Shanghai to Rotterdam cuts off three to four thousand kilometers from your from your route. So this could be a horror for Suez Canal, <coughs> but it's uh, already starting. That's slowly to develop. Uh, Russia is is looking to create harbors uh, along its northern coast. Um, but I think for me, it's it's important uh, about this to show what a dynamic concept the Silk Road is, uh, and that uh, in the future it could go to all kinds of regions, even the North Pole. I think I'm quite over time, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you both for your wonderful and provoking, I could say almost provoking. I had the feeling that some people, that there was quite some response <laughs> from, the, uh, from the audience. Um, so we'll get, of course, you'll get an opportunity to um, ask questions later. Uh, but first, it's my turn, because I have a lot of questions as well, of course, as you can imagine. Um, I wanted to, to, to start with something that you've problematized in the beginning of your talk, but something you alluded to as well, and that is the connection between, um, let's say, this impressive uh, international this economic agenda of China on the one hand, and its political system. Because, of course, that is indeed, whether it's, it's justified or not, whether it's legitimate or not, that is an association that we often make here in Europe. We, we, we tend to at least imagine that there is a, 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 an immediate connection between, um, well, a one-party system that we often refer to as authoritarian in one way or the other, and the economic success, you could say, of, of, uh, uh, and prosperity of, of China. Um, I would like to start with you, Joey. What's, what, what is the relation between these two? Is there a relation? Is that something that we like to imagine? Or is there some kind of connection between the two? To what extent is it justified? 
to draw it? Well, I think there is a connection between, of course, there is. A, it is China's foreign one part, part of China's uh, development uh, strategy, but China's uh, foreign uh, economic policy coming out of, from a very strong power state for, from a very uh, central party. So, uh, of course, it, it refers back to the political uh, regime back in China, and I think um, uh, the the what I can think of the strongest connection um, is the role played by the state in all of these investment projects. So uh, that's something uh, uh, makes it different from Western countries' investment in these regions and different from the um, private investment in these regions because uh, um, the investment in these regions involve a big China state behind it. Mm. Um, sometimes not necessarily a bad thing because it pushes things faster, make a decision making faster. But then in some other cases, um, uh, uh, over state intervention also makes this investment less efficient. Uh, like I said earlier, um, many of the cases, many of the deals go to the state-owned enterprises. Um, you may be, it's easier to justify it in the beginning uh, when China, you know, uh, goes there to invest one case, two case, bring their own money and give the deal to their own country, um, uh, own state-owned enterprises. But then if the Belt and Road Initiative really, like you said, it develops into a global scale China's outward investment, China really wants to become a, a competitive investor um, or Chinese companies want to become a, a competitive investors, then um, uh, 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 over state intervention sometimes make the uh, operation of the business less efficient. Um, yeah. Do you have it? Mm -hmm. Do you want to add anything? Yeah. Um, I think it's important the differentiation you make between the state and politics. Mm -hmm. My focus also in, in arguing that uh, uh, for the historical and current capacity of, of, of China, it's about the state, which really doesn't say that much about the political system, right? It's about mm -hmm. bureaucrats, ministries, planning agencies. Mm -hmm. um, that is different from say, well, you, that doesn't mean that you have to have a one-party state to be capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. You can still have different parties or fractions. And I think also the Chinese political system is more diverse than we think. Uh, there, is, there is much more different voices, much more experimenting, much more different groups than we, when, we, when we too easily say it's authoritarian mm -hmm. and we compare it, say, with a one-man rule in Africa or something. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different system. It's, it's, it's much more complex, and that is, I think, one thing that's really important to understand about China. Um, and the great capacity for me, I think, comes from the, the organization of its state. Uh, so the way it trains bureaucrats uh, and the influence they have and the planning agencies. And, well, that, of course, under the current regime... Uh, gets full possibilities mm -hmm. to expand. I mean, there are. Uh, I mean, I, I love just to look all around in uh, the, what Chinese planning agencies or uh, academies, what the projections they make. It's it's crazy. I mean, you have technology roadmaps until the year 2100. I mean, nobody knows, of course, where that's going. But the 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 ambition to think that through and to plan for it mm -hmm. is, I think, something quite Chinese. Yeah, I think you made a good point. It's uh, um, it's not one voice in China. Mm. Um, actually, you see, um, uh, even in the uh, Belt and Road Initiative investment, you actually see China's uh, state-owned enterprise and the private companies compete with each other for mm. those deals. Yeah. Um, and uh, in many cases, you see uh, different voices coming out from this key economic departments, the NDRC, the Ministry of Finance, the the, the exchange, uh, the foreign exchange uh, uh, authorities mm -hmm. and the uh, central bank, they actually do yeah. um, all have different uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, views mm -hmm. uh, regarding the yeah. investment. Actually, yeah, you sometimes hear competition, like yeah. how, how did this move from this ministry? And then you know that there is some power struggle going mm -hmm. to get a yeah. certain domain towards the Ministry of yeah. Finance or not. And I mean, in general, I think that the, the, this diversity is really important to to note. I mean, often in India, that's something that people say when they say what they could learn from China. They say, well, here in India, we have um, uh, an open system with closed minds. 
China has a closed system but open minds. Mm -hmm. uh, so there isn't much room for dissent, but within that there is very much more diversity thinking through of uh, experimental ideas and um, uh, and diversity of voice on the on behind the scenes. So the when it comes to because I mean you you readily make a distinction of course between let's say a political apparatus and and let and, and also for example how a, a, a state understands itself ideologically. But what what kind of role does ideology play in this then? Because I mean we still tend to see. China as one of the last, well, perhaps not de facto, but at least in name, one of the last communist countries in the world. I mean, what 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 kind of role does ideology have there? Is it is it a similar like multi various picture there, or or is it is it indeed as diverse, or what role does that play? Um, well, I think this this the so the Belt and Road Initiative in particular is, I think, an interesting case of what is going on in terms of broader ideologically in China. Mm -hmm. And there you, of course, have now the issue that it's uh, a story is needed, right? Mm -hmm. The story was communism. Uh, it became capitalism, but nobody likes to say that, and nobody, nobody is warm about capitalism, right? So it's not really a story. <coughs> um, uh, uh, one potential dangerous idea, coming, which is, I think is also growing, is nationalism uh, as, as, an, as a story about what our role in the world is. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, not officially promoted, but I think it's also something that's growing. But another thing, and I think that is uh, what this, this project also is about, um, is ideologically there is, I think, a retrieval of China's ancient history. This was, of course, under communist time, it was impossible, right? Mm -hmm. Confucius, you couldn't mention his name. Nothing could be written about him. Now, suddenly, uh, the, the, the previous president already was speaking about harmonious society, a very Confucian idea. Xi Jinping often refers to all kinds of traditional Chinese ideas. And this, of course, the Silk Road. It's also China in its most mm -hmm. glorious phase in history. So this whole I the ideological idea that you had, well, we have to burn everything from the Chinese history and we're looking to the future, what the communists said. Now you're seeing a story uh, mutating where it's, well, wait a second, we're, we're, we're actually, our history is much more glorious and interesting than we thought when we were obsessed with Western power. And that, and the Silk Road is element of that, is I think growing now as a story uh, told to Chinese. So this, this, this ideological self-image is, yeah. is rewritten, basically. And any successful cases can contribute to this successful story of uh, um, uh, the, 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 the revival of uh, old uh, good culture, gen, gen, um, uh, tradition, history, and also um, contributes to the legitimacy of mm -hmm. the ruling government and the party. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe yeah. a, a nice example is also, if you look at that maritime expansion, there recently was a big uh, <coughs> naval parade in China, mm -hmm. and Xi Jinping said there, well, this is the, the biggest uh, naval parade in China in 600 years. <laughs> uh, that's a particular date, right? That's where he, what he's referring to is Zhang He, mm -hmm. the Muslim eunuch, actually, from <laughs> inland China, who sailed the oceans for China. Uh, he went as far, he went through Southeast Asia, to Sri Lanka, set sail probably in Africa as well. Mm. Um, and so that history yeah. is, off, is now used, well, all kinds of projects that China has internationally, it's, it's, it's being connected with that part of Chinese history. Right. Interesting. The, 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 um, another question I had, and it has something to do with this, the, 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 the image that China presents of itself, to itself, but also to the, the rest of the world, of course. Um, what you've both presented here is, I mean, this is no, none of these are state secrets, I presume. Uh, this is, you know, this is how it's in the open, this information. So, I mean, we, we, I mean, we get, we, we have, a, it's, it's possible to uh, acquire a, a, a pretty uh, clear image of the ambitions that China has, at least internationally, economically, etc. Um, at the same time, um, and this is also something you stress in your book, for example, and, and uh, that you've said as well, the, the, um, the role of strategy in the, also in the, in the political culture of China is, is pretty important. Um, so is this all that there is to it? Or what, what in other words, is, is happening behind the screens? What is happening... Uh, well, I'm, I'm not saying that that's necessarily what you know, but, but, but um, uh, to what extent is there... To what extent is this, this strategy that is pursued by China mm -hmm. a transparent strategy? Because as you presented here, it seems to be a quite straightforward, transparent strategy. But mm -hmm. is that really the case? 
Do you want to? Well, well I think I think um, the this project. Okay, so Belt and Road Initiative is interesting. Uh, initially, it was not called Belt and Road Initi Initiative. A more common name was One Belt One Road. So mm -hmm. name changed. That shows that in the beginning, the government was not even very sure about what this is. Mm -hmm. um, even today, people are you know Belt and the Road, um, very wide belt and a very big road because sometimes mm. uh, sometimes uh, like you said even the projects in South America want to uh, want to be part of it mm. but South America is no nowhere near either the belt and the road on these maps mm -hmm. so it, it started from a um, naming uh, China's uh, outward um, economic experience Give it China's outward economic expansion, giving China's going out uh, uh, policy a name. So mm -hmm. they gave it a name. Uh, also, the name was given by the Chinese president, and it became a popular name. But essentially, it is not something started in 2013. It is something started earlier, China's uh, outward investment for all sorts of uh, uh, purposes, um, domestic, po political, and economic pressure. Um, to, to China was holding a lot of money that it needs to invest. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's go out and uh, invest. Mm -hmm. So initially, it was a very very um, economically driven. But now, as you can see, um, since it become bigger and bigger, um, it, it, it clearly has geopolitical um, reference behind it now. Mm -hmm. And especially um, if you look at China's geopolitical, uh, ge geographical position, China is uh, surrounded by many competitors. Not like the US. The US has Canada and Mexico, both uh, uh, great friends. Mm -hmm. But China is surrounded by um, uh, Japan, which uh, uh, invaded China in the past. China surrounded by North Korea, uh, which is also a tough, tough uh, neighbor to have. China <laughs> surrounded by Russia, South Russia, um, mm. uh, South, South Korea, Korea uh, Vietnam. Yeah, mm. uh, yeah, exactly, Vietnam. It had the war with uh, India. It has border disputes. Mm. So um, now that this this thing become a be, become an actual thing called mm -hmm. a Belt and Road Initiative, you can't ignore the geopolitical reference anymore. At some point, some Chinese um, uh, scholars was uh, was suggesting when we talk about uh, uh, investment in on, along the Belt and Road, we should avoid the, uh, use the word strategic mm -hmm. or geopolitics. Uh, we should uh, just uh, um, uh, uh, emphasize the economic uh, purposes. Um, but then again, obviously, this is not the best way to deal with uh, a geopolitical uh, reference, geopolitical implications, because geopolitical implications exist, mm -hmm. and also. China always talk about uh, um, no interference. We do business. Uh, business is about money. We we, we invest. We wanted this uh, um, projects to earn money. We want to establish good relationship with the host um, economy. But as China becoming more and more involved in. Um, uh, these countries. Mm -hmm. China can't uh, stay away from the domestic politics anymore. And in many cases, in the case of uh, um, uh, uh, the, the Pakistan, China Pakistan Economic Corridor, China went to Pakistan. China's good friend, the state leader met up, shook hand, take a picture, um, billions of dollars deal assigned, uh, but that's just the beginning, mm -hmm. right? When the actual projects started, they realized, oh, it's not when the state leader signed the deal, shake hands, then uh, after five years, these uh, pl power plants would just uh, uh, emerge automatically. You need to, they face a lot of uh, problems. They realize, oh, there is a, a conflict between um, the central power and the local uh, powers, and there are competition between different uh, local interest groups and the political mm -hmm. parties, and then there's a, a security uh, attacks on the Chinese uh, 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 project uh, operators. So China faces all these uh, domestic, uh, political, uh, or economic uh, um, uh, re uh, challenges uh, mm -hmm. in the host country, not just Pakistan, in some other um, countries as well. So um, China, at some point, needs to be strategic, needs mm -hmm. to be political, of course, in the in the in the in a smart way. But it mm -hmm. can't avoid being strategic and political. Right. Uh, let me just add a few points there. I mean, I think it's uh, what you mentioned. Uh, 
when you're talking about strategy in China, it's not something that you see as something that's fixed for the long term and rigid. This is really the distinction with Soviet planning. Right. I mean, China's planning is in that sense much more flexible, and the strategy, the Belt and Road itself, <clears throat> I don't think anybody knows exactly what it's going to look like in 20 years. They have ideas, plans, but every time it's adapting to circumstances, and <clears throat> as I think every world power just first needs to learn what happens when it does something and respond to that. So I think that's also part of a Chinese strategy, what they call it uh, crossing the river by looking for stepping stones, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. seeing where you can stand and then. Uh, mm -hmm. Not just yeah. running in and looking for the shortest route. <clears throat> so I think that's part of it. This, it's a strategy, but it's a flexible strategy. Mm -hmm. I think the second part is indeed... Um, <clears throat> it's not exactly clear everything they're doing here. The strategy is not that clear for themselves, but also not uh, for, for the countries involved. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yes, of course this is in the open daylight, what they're doing here. But we're not exactly sure what they want with those ports. Nobody knows exactly. Do they really want to put their marine there, or is it just commercial? Um, is it about depth traps, right? What people are talking about now, which the, often is associated with the United States, right? right? Lend money, you get into a problem, and then you get all the assets you want. It's not exactly clear, right? Mm -hmm. if the, and and the, the, the example of the Greek harbor shows that they can actually, by thinking about the long term, not at all look for ways to control the country, but try to s look for synergies. So I think that would be the second point here uh, in terms of its strategy. It's, it's something that, yes, what they're doing is out in the open, but how are they going to use it? Mm -hmm. We still don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess finally what would be important here is, maybe more directly to your question, <coughs> um, if, if we can all see this, uh, if they're master strategists, they shouldn't put their cards on the table. I think they don't also. Uh, I think that's still the case. Mm -hmm. um, uh, an imperative also, especially by Deng Xiaoping, was uh, always be more powerful uh, than you seem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is changing a bit under Xi Jinping. He, he, he wants to show how powerful he is, which before that every Chinese leader always emphasized what a weak country it was. But I still think they kind of still follows that precept. Mm -hmm. So even if they're now showing more what they can do, they actually can do way more. Right? They're still not showing. Uh, 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 there is, of course, a much more uh, 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 advanced strategy behind it. Um, uh, many parts which we don't, uh, 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 by definition, don't see, uh, see clearly. Mm -hmm. um, but it is something that are, people are getting more attentive to. And I think one interesting case is a whole debate that's going on in Australia right now. Mm -hmm. Um, where uh, uh, there is, uh, especially by one journalist who wrote a book called Silent Invasion, uh, and he claims to show there that there is this total strategy by China to take over Australia. Uh, so, I mean, this is just a deba debate evolving that perhaps gives a little bit of insight into what, what goes on behind the scenes, what we don't see. Right. But the impression that I get from what both of you are saying is that, is that key to whatever strategy there may be is, is the plurality of alternatives that China is creating for itself, yeah. right? The, the many yeah. different options that it's it yeah. is, is, uh, is opening up And this is a bigger, bigger region. Mm -hmm. you could, they can't have just one strategy um, to deal with all sorts of cases, right? Mm -hmm. They're all very complicated uh, geopolitical, geoeconomic uh, uh, factors uh, involved in by different cases. So um, they have plural strategy mm -hmm. as well. The The... To, to get back to something you referred to before as well, the, the, because of course this also gives rise to, you could say, some fear or skepticism elsewhere in the world, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you see that also indeed in, in popular media, for example, where we, well, which often refer to, seem to refer to China as some kind of threat, some kind of unknown threat. We don't know exactly what's at stake yet, but mm -hmm. some kind of image of China is created. You also refer to it in your book, uh, which also sometimes appeals to very old uh, racist stereotypes. Mm -hmm. um, should we be afraid of this potential that China is creating? To what extent is it, uh, I mean, leaving aside its, its, all its problematic connotations also historically, to what extent is there uh, a reason to be somewhat uh, skeptical or afraid of this potential that China is creating for itself from a European perspective, for mm -hmm. example? Mm -hmm. could, you, could you respond to that? Not me? Yeah. Um, well, um, 
I don't think uh, uh, China's uh, outward uh, um, economic expansion, like I said, this uh, gradual um, mm -hmm. uh, starting from the 70s, 80s, 90s, um, are directly threatening to the um, you know the Western economic order or the liberal Western economic order because China very much uh, is uh, embedded into disorder mm -hmm. uh, China is a member of WTO China is a, a, a big trade partner with uh, EU countries um, China pursue um, uh, Collaborate collaboration opportunity with the EU. Um, uh, so I wouldn't I wouldn't say um, their economic links post uh, uh, ultimate threat for the the Western um, society or, or international uh, economic mm -hmm. community. Um, but uh, uh, we are aware of some of the. Um, uh, business, economic uh, um, action, behavior uh, from the Chinese side don't necessarily uh, match uh, the standards, the Western stan standards. And that's something I think uh, um, should be and could be um, solved through uh, negotiation mm -hmm. with China directly. Uh, but uh, also bear in mind that China is also not a one big, one one voice, right? Mm -hmm. There are many different Chinas. There, there are many different uh, uh, Chinese uh, um, actors uh, being active in the international um, uh, economic mm -hmm. activities, like the state-owned enterprises. I also talk about the problems about these state-owned enterprises, but also uh, private companies. Um, and also there are many Chinese companies who try to invest uh, abroad, but uh, um, uh, 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 they don't really succeed. So mm -hmm. they are much less um, threatening to mm -hmm. the West. Um, a lot of the economic activities are profit-driven, economic-driven, um, uh, and a lot of problems could be solved through negotiations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'd say in answer to your question, should we fear China's rise? Um, I'd say yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, China is an emerging power, mm -hmm. which gives it the whole range of everything. Everything comes with it. Yes, it's acting strategic, but yes, also it's uh, it, it's creating tremendous wealth. It's creating middle classes. Mm -hmm. It's creating tourists, which we can interact with. It's okay. Right? It's investments for our country. It's just a country with a tremendous impact, and it will go through the whole palette of everything that happens when a new country emerges. The biggest danger, I think, is if we ha if we approach that with a very singular view. So either uh, we say China is a threat and we need to work against it. I think that's dangerous mm -hmm. because it will become the threat then. Right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the, the, uh, the dangerous side of what the United States is doing now. If you start treating it as an adversary, you're, you're actually going to make it more, well, more, more likely that it'll, it'll behave that way. Where you want to have the, the roads open towards different kinds of cooperation. But I think it's also naive to say, well, it's just, it's just uh, altruistic, business. economic mm -hmm. business. I mean... Mm -hmm. No country. Were, and in that sense, I'd say China fits into a pattern with all kinds of uh, that, that that has happened historically with other countries. Um, what it does, yes, it acts strategically, but I don't have any um, illusions that other countries don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, China does things that other countries do. My point would actually be, China, watch out! China is perhaps more capable than many other countries <laughs> are. It's just more. It thinks better strategically in many ways, but. That it has a geopolitical agenda and everything, that's of course what every great power does. Mm -hmm.